Hello and welcome to your post-practical lecture for experiment three. In this post-practical lecture, we will cover the, of course, as always, the sections um, that you need to include in your report. And um, we will really look at what we covered in this experiment specifically. So remember, we looked at a liquid vapor equilibrium of a methanol methylene chloride system. And methylene chloride also has another name, which you might have picked up on. It's also called dichloromethane or 1,2 dichloromethane, uh, DCM, something like that, methanol, uh, called methanol in general, but this has a quite a number of names. <clears throat> and the sections you need to include in your report is a title page, a method section, results, uh, your discussion questions as always, and then references. A good title is usually kept in under 15 words and conveys the main concepts of an experiment. So also it's including basically the variables that you have. The this, so the this and the that, the experiencing that, if you want to put it like that. I always like to use it as if I were to summarize this experiment to a friend in a sentence. How would I state it? And I would write that down and from there I would try and tweak it and make it a bit more formal. So to be creative, I allow myself and then I tweak it to make it more formal. So creative, but not informal. Um, essentially, this makes that you don't just copy from the manual. You just take it away and you sit there and you try and think of how would you summarize it for someone else. Um, yeah, of course, you need to try and convey as much information about the experiment as possible uh, without it being a paragraph. So those are your challenges, but is also where you can take your um, inspiration from. So take the keywords and mix them together and come up with a few titles. Try pick one that's less than 15 words and be creative. That is essentially what would be a good title at the end of the day. Then your method section needs to read like a story for someone to follow because essentially after reading the method section somebody with a firm understanding of chemistry needs to be able to repeat what you did so in other words you need to go into detail but not oversimplify or use too much detail um, because this person is on your level is what you expect so you write to someone which is on your level so if you need to explain something like um, this needs to be done. You need to wash it before. Um, that's not something you will put in the method section. You will not say, remember to wash the glassware beforehand. You won't put that in your method section. You would say, you would simply say, use a round bottom flask. And it's implied that that person understands they will need to ensure that it's a clean washed round bottom flask, for example, because that's too much detail. And you also won't oversimplify it and just say, the setup is made for a vapor liquid equilibrium because how does that look? What does that mean? You know, this person isn't a specialist in the field, so that you can elaborate on. So you need to find that balance. Um, of course, a qualitative sketch is always handy. You don't have to have artworks for your experimental setup, so you can have some hand drawn sketches, which will just aid in your understanding or the readability of your content. And um, then, of course, the things that are the most important is that which is easily misunderstood or really important um, to emphasize. So emphasize that in your method section. Don't just gloss over them. Um, yeah. And also don't be afraid to add a theory that you need, uh, that you feel might be needed. For example, a few sentences on what is refractive index. You will say that we measure the refractive measure the refractive index of seven mixtures. Then you will say, refractive index is a da-da-da-da-da, and give the equation that it's measured from, and maybe like a little schematic of the instrument and how it's used. That would be very handy for someone to have alongside them when they are measuring refractive index. So essentially, that is my tips for you for the method section. Incorporate all this, give enough information for someone who has your level of experience but has not done the experiment yet. How would you explain it to them? How would you give them the opportunity to do the experiment after? How would you write a page for them to read 
and then they should be able to do the experiment after that. Okay, turning to the results, um, in the first aspect, you will do a calibration with some known mixtures. So you make up known mixtures with known mole fractions of methanol and dichloromethane, and you measure their refractive index. So in other words, if you have a plot of refractive index against methanol and a plot of refractive index against methylene chloride, you should get two graphs, uh, two linear graphs as such, which you can have a y equals mx plus b fit to. And this gives you a calibration graph from which you now can take any, if you have the refractive index of a mixture, then you can look up, the, you take the refractive index, you put it down there, and you can get the mole fraction of methanol present in the mixture. And then, of course, you can get from that the mole fraction of methylene chloride. Or you can take the refractive index from your mixture and measure, see what the methylene chloride mole fraction is, and from that get the methanol. You understand? So that is why you need these calibration curves, so that you can construct other plots from that information, which is going to be what we do in a second. So to construct your temperature composition diagram, you will use tables two and three for this. So using your refractive index calibration graphs and equations, you will take your boiling, your boiling point information and the refractive index of your distillate and your residue, and using your, your lines of best fit, translate that into mole fractions for your distillate and your residue. So you take the, 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 the refractive index, Plug it in here, calculate the mole fraction of the one, one minus the, this one gives you that one, one minus this one gives you that one. Do it for the appropriate methanol or uh, chloromethane, whichever one you choose. And then you're going to make a plot of boiling point against one of these two. So for the distillate, boiling point against this, and for the residue, boiling point against mole fraction methanol, for example. This will then give you graphs that look either like this, depending on which one you chose. So if you chose mole fraction methanol, it should look something like this. Mole fraction DCM, methylene chloride, looks something like this. And it should be a minimum azeotrope. So what does that mean? You'll have a residue line that goes like this, and you should have a distillate data points that go like this. And that's essentially your T mole flow temperature composition diagram from which you're going to make to read of your um, azeotrope mixture which is the mixture where you can go anywhere else but we'll talk about that just now okay so your discussion questions read and report the composition and volume input of the azeotropic mixture uh, from the temperature composition diagram. So now an azeotropic mixture is a mixture with a fixed boiling point, thus the separation of the mixture is not possible. Both constituents will be present. Where on the graph is this? That point that I showed there on the graph. So where your distillate and your residue connect. That means that the distillate and the, and the residue have the same boiling point. So in other words, you can't separate them because both continuously boil and condense and boil and condense and always in the, in the residue and in the um, distillate, you have the same composition. So you can never separate the two um, compositions from one another. You'll always get the same mole fraction, essentially, right? Um, so find that point. How will the azeotropic mixture influence the composition of the distillate and residue during the fractional distillation? Well, uh, I just explained what will happen if you start with that mixture, so what will happen? Explain why the boiling point goes through a minimum value if the vapor pressure reaches a maximum value. And try and find an equation which correlates vapor pressure and boiling point. Also rationalize this. Just look at what equations you have, like clausius clapeyron etc., which correlates your vapor pressure with boiling point. And then say, why does it go through a minimum value if the vapor pressure reaches a maximum value as the composition changes? Ask yourself that. Um, why is a constant atmospheric pressure necessary during the determination of the TX diagram? I essentially ask yourself what would be the, the effect of the opposite 
if we were varying our pressure outside the flask or in the flask, what would be the effect on the vapor pressure, for example? What would be the effect on the boiling point if we change the vapor pressure? What is the definition of the boiling point of a substance? Those are all very important questions. Okay, and I hope this has given you some hints to answering them. Finally, your references. Always use the Royal Society of Chemistry citation style. You can use Mendeley or the Practical Guides examples on how to cite each type of source by hand. And use like the library and reactions to find good scientific literature. Please do not just Google. As always, good luck and um, thank you for watching.